Welcome back to Keeping the World Company here on ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. Today we're going to talk about Europe. Is Europe facing a 1938 situation? What should we be learning from history? And this, of course, affects Kyiv. It affects Western Europe. It affects the EU. It affects NATO. Uh, for this discussion, uh, we have an austere panel. Uh, we have Tim Apicella, my co-host, uh, Jean Rosenfeld, a retired uh, professor of history and religion, UCLA, and Manfred Henningsen, a retired uh, a political science uh, professor uh, from the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Welcome to the show, all of you. Uh, let's start with you, Tim. Um, you know, things seem to be coming together on this comparison of what happened in the 30s and what is happening now. And in a recent show, we talked about how Trump was following Mein Kampf and Hitler's playbook. But now we should talk about how, you know, the Chamberlain appeasement back in Munich in 19, was it 38, mm -hmm. uh, is replaying itself. And uh, the EU and Europe is kind of going right and going soft on Putin. Uh, can you talk about it? Yes, a little bit, because uh, you, you hit the, the correct term, and that is appeasement. And um, as we know, the policy of appeasement, uh, particularly regarding the Munich Agreement between Italy, France, um, who else was that? Uh, Britain and Germany, uh, they carved up Czechoslovakia. Uh, we don't have that exactly happening here, and we don't have the 1936 uh, Germany invasion of the uh, Rhineland area where France did absolutely nothing, but what we have is uh, political appeasements. And um, that's in the form of not funding the effort in Ukraine. Uh, I, I, I was impressed when Russia first invaded Ukraine and uh, all of the EU and the United States rushed to its aid and um, on a limited basis because they were trying to avoid, avoid a World War III and direct intervention of NATO into the Ukraine war. Uh, but they, they started supplying weapons and money, and Ukraine desperately needed that. And uh, that was successful until the United States started getting cold feet, thanks to the mega Republicans and uh, the conservative efforts in, in, in the EU. And uh, the recent elections in a lot of European nations is uh, a lot of conservatives are winning those elections. Uh, will that have an impact on how uh, they treat uh, the support of Ukraine uh, that is yet to be seen. But uh, again, appeasement's never a, a, an overnight ordeal. It's usually a slow march, a slow walk to uh, capitulation. Yeah, I'm reminded, Gene, that uh, when the French representative to the conference in Munich came back to France, they threw flowers at him, uh, not, not realizing that, uh, you know, the, the horror of what was going to follow of what had just happened. So Gene, can you, can you help us understand why the move right in Europe? What is causing that? And how does that affect you know, the possibility of appeasing Putin? Um, and you know, where are we going on this? Because it's, it's not the way it was at the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine. It seems like we are sort of advancing toward a tipping point uh, that we see occasionally in history um, of an era. Uh, we have an era behind us for some 85 years or 87 years from 1938 of uh, one of the absolute worst and most consequential conflicts in human history where a dictator attempted through his mega mania, megalomania, to uh, expand his territory continentally over adjoining states, and at the same time engage in what we now recognize as ethnic cleansing of gypsies and uh, gays and uh, Jews and other undesirables to, to create a purified utopian realm. It, which is a fantasy, actually, if you think about it, a delusion and a fantasy. But in order to achieve that, he had to con first convince the German people, 
who were still reeling from a defeat by the Allied powers in World War I, that Germany was crashing, that it was uh, engaging, it was enduring not only humiliation, but carnage. And this is the message that an ideologue uh, and strongman will utilize to soften up a populace uh, that is living in fear and hopelessness. It is what we call a pre-apocalyptic state of mind. And what often follows on that is apocalypse itself. Apocalypse is not some spiritual thing that happens in heaven. It's an earthly conflict and it's the way we have throughout history of describing what war really entails, which is atrocity, tragedy, uh, fear. And you have to soften up the populace first with fear, sense of vulnerability, a desire that um, taking rational uh, steps is too little, too late. And what we really need is somebody to get in there and make decisions for us right now. Well, that opens the question of whether Trump and his um, rhetoric um, has had an effect on Europe. I remember reading a couple of weeks ago, Manfred, um, that there were European countries that were huddling to try to find out how to deal with the possibility that he would be reelected. They are aware and concerned of all of that. But I want to go back to the Weimar Republic and what Jean said. You know, after World War I, yeah, there was a lot of disenchantment about the way it was settled, the armistice, the way the French treated the Germans at that time. But in fact, it was a liberal democracy. In fact, the economy wasn't so bad at all. In fact, it was heading in the right direction. But Hitler's job, as Trump's job, as a demagogue and a would-be dictator, was to convince people that it was failing. And that was his first step. That was his rhetoric. He was a good speaker. Um, and that's what happened. And what's interesting is that he had to do big lies in order to convince them that liberal democracy was really not the way to go, and they had to listen to him, and he alone could fix it. And that really sounds like what's going on in this country. Um, do you see the comparison there? Um, do you see what Hitler did to, to lie about the condition of the German economy, the condition of civil rights and so forth, liberal government in the Weimar Republic? Look, I'm sorry, but I have to disagree with all three of you. Uh, I do not think that the elections to the European Parliament have created a 1938 syndrome. Uh, Tim's comments about conservatives, I think we have to start with that, because the conservatives uh, are the center. They are in the majority, and they are not abandoning the Ukraine. On the contrary. And Ursula von der Leyen will become president again uh, of the commission. And so for that reason, I think that argument doesn't work. And you have to also understand that the, the move to the right about which some of you have been talking is not really happening. Uh, you have the Scandinavian countries, Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, you have all of these countries where the right wing has lost. Uh, now, when you're speaking about Germany, you have a divided country mentally between East and West Germany. And what you have, uh, I mean, my comparison for the, the situation in Germany today would be not the Weimar Republic, but the United States after the Civil War. And for the next hundred years, you know, you have a division in the United States between these two parts, the winner and the loser of the Civil War. And what you have in Germany is a divided country. It's absolutely stunning when you look, you know, at the, the AFD is winning in the five eastern states, and they will win in three states in state elections in the fall. But Germany as a whole is still run by... Uh, I mean, the majority is for Merkel's CDU. Now, what will happen to Scholz after this disaster for him? 
and the Greens and the Liberals, the FDP. I don't know. Uh, but you will not have new elections in Germany because it's very difficult. Uh, he, it, the German president, I mean, remember, Germany is not a presidential democracy, but a parliamentary democracy. So what Macron did in, in, in France, uh, the German president cannot do. Uh, it, it is the issue of a, a majority or a lack of a majority in the Bundestag if they cannot get a chancellor uh, <clears throat> elected. Then you have a dissolution of, of the parliament, but only then. So for that reason, I'm less apocalyptic than the three of you are. Uh, I do not see an abandonment of the Ukraine. On the contrary, uh, the support for the Ukraine holds, especially in the conservative, uh, because of the conservative uh, majority in the European elections. Manfred, things are changing in Europe. I mean, even if you, even if you take that view, that still, you know, the conservatives run Germany and to a large extent, uh, you know, the, the people who support Ukraine run France. The fact is that the newspapers are full of stories about how things are moving right. I agree that uh, the, the countries that are close to Ukraine are, you know, are unified in, in uh, opposing Putin. They have a lot to lose, but we have other other countries, that, and the two largest countries in economically and in, in size are Germany and France in Europe, and <clears throat> and the newspapers report to us that their their uh, their electorate is moving right, um, their candidates are moving right. That's not true. Not in Germany. In Germany, it's Merkel CDU, which is the largest. Well, you point. just re you just referred to Schulz as having to deal with a disaster. What is a disaster if not apocalyptic, or at least the signal for apocalypse? No, it's his failure as a politician, and the failure also of the Greens, and the failure of the Liberals. So what you have uh, is uh, the failure of the government in Germany at this point. Um, but if you would have, I mean, you will not have new elections until next year. And if you get elections, you, the CDU will become uh, the majority party. This will have to form a coalition with, uh, if the liberals survive, which is not possible. But you see, you have in Germany, this, this, that's why I brought up the division uh, uh, argument. You have one new party that emerged as a result of a very charismatic young woman, well, young woman, she's 44. Um, her name is Wagenknecht. She created, she's, she was formerly, you know, the lead person within the left. The left is almost gone, dying. The left party, which was the former regime party in, in uh, East Germany. But she created a new party and this party jumped from nowhere to 5.9%. And she, as a former East German, has uh, cut into the ADF, the ADF uh, electorate. Now, what will both, I mean, when you, you had Zelensky come to the German parliament yesterday or the day before yesterday, he gave a speech there. I mean, you looked at the image both on the left and the right side. The seats were empty. So the FD people and the people on the left, including Wagenknecht's uh, the party, did not attend the speech by Zelensky, but the center was uh, solid. So what people are, you are expecting- that they refused to come and hear him? Yes, because well, that, that they, are, they are Putin friends. They are, they are Putin friends. That sounds, yeah, that sounds like what would happen in the American Congress, doesn't it? It's well, disrespect for the institutions in government. We hadn't yes. heard that before, had we? Well, no, well, you have had that before, but you see what I think will, will, that's another speculative argument. But what people think is, since you have AFD people being on trial for having been funded by China and Russia, uh, they think that the AFD will self-destruct. 
but that's speculation. But at this point, I do not believe that Europe is in the situation of 1938. And you okay, have to okay, remember- Okay, okay, we got it, we got it. No need to tell us again. No, no, uh, but okay. I think there's an important point because since Finland and Sweden entered NATO, uh, Putin, as crazy as he may be, but I do not think he will dare to uh, start war against any of the Eastern member states of uh, NATO. Jean, what do you think? I agree with Manfred, we are not yet at 1938. However, we are definitely heading in that direction. The move to the right among these parties in the major European states, and they exist in almost all the major European states, uh, these right-wing parties, including Norway. You remember that tremendous tragedy that occurred on the island when that uh, crazy guy went uh, nuts and killed all those kids. Um, he, he, he issued a manifesto, and it was a right-wing manifesto, that was copied in New Zealand, of all places, by another shooter, and which has reverberations here in this country among the people that we've been keeping eye on for a very long time. There is a general right-wing trend globally, and we don't know why these trends happen globally. There was a terrorist, religious terrorist trend a few decades ago globally. We don't know why that they emerge this way, except that we're a very interconnected world. And what these trends do is they, they make people feel uncertain and scared. And they're looking for a strong father figure to protect them. This is uh, the tradition of the West is patriarchy. And it's the patriarchal leaders that become the umbrellas under which people huddle. So I both agree and disagree with Manfred. I agree it may not be happening in front of us right now, but I disagree that the entry of Sweden and Finland into NATO is going to have any impact whatsoever on what Putin decides to do, because he and China, uh, prior to the Beijing Winter Games, uh, issued a 6,000 word um, statement agreeing to basically try to encourage the decline of the West. And, and Europe was very, very dependent on Russian energy up to the recent time and is still feeling it does not want a big war again because it knows what that entails. So these heads of state that are moderate, like Schultz and Macron, um, are extremely wary when they see these unapologetic proto-fascist groups arising and gaining seats in their countries. There's a lot of fear, and fear breeds insecurity, which breeds a, a desire for safety under the aegis of some charismatic leader who will guarantee that, again, he alone will fix it. We have different views expressed by, you know, Manfred and uh, Jean, and you get the uh, hapless job of trying to find a path or agree or disagree with what has been said. What's your view of this? What would you offer for this um, discussion? Well, I just know one thing. Um, appeasement takes place when there's silence. When outrageous words and, and actions take place, uh, I'm thinking of the last many years of Donald Trump in this country, uh, appeasement takes place when there's deafening silence, where no one steps up to, to the podium. Uh, I'm thinking of the silence when the GOP fails to step up and say, as our party leader, as our president, um, his words and actions were inappropriate, with the exception of Liz Cheney, Adam Kissinger, and Mitt Romney. I know appeasement takes place when the media gives uh, Donald Trump so much airtime that he gets his platform and his points across. As warped as they may seem, uh, it permeates into the American mentality. I know appeasement takes place when the Bar Association fails to act up at all when there's attacks on the judicial system or there's outrageous um, you know, attempts to avoid justice in this country. 
I know appeasement takes place when the Society of Professional Journalists uh, fails to write any op-eds about Donald Trump and the way he's covered by the media. So um, that's my answer. Silence is the pathway to appeasement. Manfred, I want to ask you, you know, what, what Europe should do, what Germany should do, given this, um, you know, rightward movement. Um, and what, you know, what should they do about dealing with Putin? So, you know, what, what, is, what is interesting, and, and somebody said it in one of those articles that we've been reading, we've been reading a couple of things. The problem is uh, that Europe has not sought to win or allow Ukraine to win. Europe has given Ukraine the ability to, to hold, maybe, but not to win. And so it's like, it's like soft. It's not really determined to help Ukraine win. And that's, and that's too bad, because in the meantime, Ukraine is being destroyed. Um, the other, the other part of that, Manfred, is um, you know, first part is what should Europe do now? Is Europe still as strong as it was when when all this started, in terms of the um, the relationships in the EU, in terms of the relationships in in NATO, um, or has it deteriorated as a community of nations? I don't think it has deteriorated, and I don't think the support of the Ukraine has uh, become less. I mean, uh, you could criticize Scholz, the German chancellor, for being hesitant, um, but he just uh, promised to send another uh, Patriot uh, station to the Ukraine. Uh, there are already two uh, that he has sent uh, to the Ukraine. Will you, will, will you agree with me that Ukraine is in no better than a holding pattern? Its institutions are being physically destroyed by a kinetic war that doesn't stop every day. Um, it, it's not winning. Will you agree with me about that? Partially. To some extent, uh, that is happening, but NATO cannot move in full-blown, uh, you know, with its weapons uh, to move against uh, Putin's Russia. I mean, you have this conference taking place in Switzerland very soon. And I think the result of that will be that they will reaffirm uh, the financial support and the material support uh, for Ukraine. The Ukraine is not so far defeated. Uh, so for that reason, you know, I have some problems with this apocalyptic uh, thinking that uh, do you have any level of concern about it, Manfred? Well, look, since Sweden and and Finland joined NATO, the closest to uh, Russia, I mean, in addition to the Baltic states, I feel much more certain that you will not have the Ukrainian invasion become World War III. And I do not think that Xi Jinping is stupid enough, uh, you know, to somehow encourage Putin uh, to move in. I mean, now whatever Xi Jinping uh, wants to do, I mean, he has a problem. He has problems at home uh, with his economy. So for that reason, you know, I am not thinking that we find ourselves in 38 or 39 at this point. And I do not yeah. think that Trump will become president. Do you, do you have any level of concern about the, the right would be? Uh, yeah, sure. No, no, yes. But I, I mean, in Germany, I do not think that the AFD will become a majority party. It will not replace either the CDU or the SPD. Um, but what you have, you know, but that is not limited to, to Germany. You have this decline of all of the left parties, the socialist parties, all over Europe. I mean, you are, you could say as Americans, you can be happy because you never had a left party uh, ever for reasons that I think have to do with that, you know, whatever there were, whatever they existed in the United States in the late 19th century, when all of these left parties came into being in both Western countries, 
with the exception of the US, it was racism. Uh, the US did not, I mean, the labor movements did not want to integrate the freed slaves. And so <laughs> the proletariat was divided, you know, in the United States, and they never got off the ground. I totally agree with that. Tim, you had, you had your hand up. I did. Um, I'd like to ask Manfred a question, and that is, uh, Manfred, do you make a distinction between those countries that are NATO countries in the proximity of Ukraine versus those nations that are non-NATO countries, um, Belarus, Hungary, and the like? Um, are they more susceptible to uh, Putin's invasion? Well, they are susceptible to Putin's corruption. Um, even though you have, I mean, when you're looking at Hungary, you have just, uh, you had, I mean, in the EU elections, you have uh, a counterparty emerging with 30% uh, to Orban. So even there, uh, you know, you have this uh, anti right wing, anti authoritarian uh, phenomenon taking place. And now I think, and Scandinavia, you know, is very interesting because in most of the Scandinavian countries, you have at least these right-wing parties reaching 20 or more than 20 percent uh, and participating in some cases, you know, in governments or supporting them in Finland and Sweden and in, in Norway. But I mean, they are declining. Uh, in, in in those countries, and I think in Germany, this election may scare the hell out of the German electorate. I mean, you still have protests taking place against the right wing in German cities in the West. Well, the today. same thing is happening in France. There are there are protests against the right wing. There's some light at the end of the tunnel. Jean, I want to go to you for a minute. Um, you know, it seems to me that we have a certain trend that we can track here just by by the media, including European media, of course, um, and commentators. And then we have uh, what's going on in this country where um, everyone, including Robert Kagan, uh, thinks there's at least a fair chance that the um, the government will fall into Trump's hands in January. And we know that Europe is watching what happens in this country. So I wonder if I could ask you a hard question. Um, you know, what, what, what um, all, all of us have been talking about is this rightward turn uh, in Europe. How would Trump's ascendancy in January, 2025 affect that? Hugely. Already European moderates and leaders are trying to get together and discuss and I'm sure they will in this conference in Switzerland, is it that Zelensky is calling for? I'm sure they will talk to one another about how they would manage the Ukraine war challenge if Trump becomes president, because judging by his very recent past behavior and his present statements, Trump is aligned with Vladimir Putin and Americans have not faced up to that fact. The other thing is Trump is embarked, not just himself, but the MAGA movement in general, which is a group of factions that have come together in an, a, a way that I actually anticipated in 2011. <laughs> Unfortunately, I hoped it wouldn't happen, but it did happen. Uh, uh, a coming together of factions um, who basically want to change American institutions. There are plans, uh, formal plans afoot to do that if Trump becomes president. I do not agree that Trump will necessarily win. I'm hopeful, as my father always used to say, that um, he had faith in the common man. And when the common man and woman go to the voting booth, if it's a fair, if it's a fair vote, um, and they, they all turn out as they should, um, I believe perhaps uh, Biden may prevail. Nevertheless, when I say Biden, I mean democracy. He's the only, uh, he's the only placeholder for democracy for us. 
and um, all these uh, qualms about uh, Biden and his age and third party candidates and staying home and pro-Palestinian movements and so forth. Uh, if Americans are smart, they'll put the, those on one side and they will vote for democracy. However, we are really, if you go back to 2014, which seems like to, to be a, a tipping point year when Putin got very aggressive, when you go back to 2014 and you think about, say, um, what was the status of the right, and uh, the underground right, the alt-right, the uh, Charlottesville, they will not replace it right. What was their status in the United States? What was the status of the right-wing parties in many European states? I mean, we knew about the Le Pen movement in France, but uh, we didn't know as much about what is brewing today. And even though we see little dips in their support from time to time, it still is something which is on the rise. Also be very, very cognizant of the fact that it's almost never that a fascist or proto-fascist movement wins an election with a majority vote. They always come into power as a minority. Manfred, how much of uh, what Jean just said do you agree with? I mean, well, you, last... you didn't agree with our uh, view of the, the risks here, but what about um, the connection, the nexus between what is happening in the US and what will happen in Europe? The Europeans are afraid of Trump becoming president. Um, and <clears throat> his deals with Putin, potential deal with Putin. But I do not think it will paralyze them. If Trump becomes president, it will, I think, unify the EU even more. However, there is one question mark, and that is France. Uh, because if uh, the Le Pen party becomes the governing party, the government party, if uh, this young guy who Marine Le Pen has uh, put up as her replacement for the prime minister, if he becomes under Macron prime minister, then I think there is some trouble for the European Union. But you see, there is something else that we have not talked about, which I find uh, troubling. In the German EU election, some, something contributed to the decline of the Greens from 20% from the last parliamentary elections to the Euro ele EU elections now down to, I think, 12%. And that is that the young people in Germany, I mean, you had for this election, people could vote from 16 up. Uh, so they reduced, you know, the, the age to 16. And the surprising result of that is, of, has been, that the majority of the young have not voted for the Greens. They have, not, however, not voted for the AfD either. They have voted for all kinds of splinter parties, uh, you know, that had some kind of rebellious causes with which these young people sympathized. So what you have is, you could almost say, a collapse of the Green constituency. And people say, this is not limited to Germany, it's in other uh, European countries. And if that, if that happens here uh, in the United States, you know, Kennedy <laughs> will become even more of a problem for Biden than I think he has been uh, so far. We've got, we've got to close, Manfred. We're out of time. I want to go to you, Tim, for your, your final comments, if you will. As, as you know, I don't, I don't feel that... Uh, Kids at 16 ought to vote. They don't know enough. They don't have a life experience. And they go for uh, fragmented causes, which is not, not healthy. I, <clears throat> I also want to ask you, though, um, is, is, does this conversation make you more or less optimistic? Less optimistic these days, uh, especially after reading the Kagan article, uh, because I think it's spot on. Um, but 
you know, let me just go with my cl closing um, thoughts here, and that is uh, some of these conservative movements, um, their, their foothold or their toehold usually starts with um, what is perceived, and I didn't say is, but perceived as out of control immigration. And that's how they get their toehold into American politics, into European politics. And I think that is very strong right now. And what does that lead to? That leads to some isolationism um, that follows that. Um, until these societies start to address what is perceived as out of control immigration, uh, this continues and it continues to get worse. And then you have the autocrats um, basically tap into that, that angst, that grievance of out of control immigration. And they carry it further and further down the road to autocracy. So that's happening in Europe. And I, I can tell you right now, uh, in the United States, it's alive and well. Uh, the Biden administration is perceived as being uh, feckless towards immigration policies. And I'd have to agree with that perception. Uh, there's a very uh, famous uh, late night comic named Steve Colbert. And he's taken the MAGA moniker and says, make America Germany around 1938. And to some degree, you know, when we had uh, Charlottesville and uh, recently on, on Trump's social media, where a supporter says we now have a unified Reich, um, you start to wonder whether that's comic humor or is that uh, reality taking shape in the form of, of comic humor at the late night shows. I would like to come back to Tim's point about migration having an impact um, on not only the US but European countries. The irony is that everybody in Germany, in France, the Brits learned that after Brexit is that they need migrants in order to you know, keep their depleted labor force up to date. And uh, so for that reason, <laughs> Whatever people try to do by curbing migration. On the other hand, you have all of the economic leaders in Germany, for example, pushing for in migration of people. Uh, so you have to wonder whether people will at one point uh, realize the need for in-migration of millions of people into their societies that cannot replenish themselves by uh, procreation. I think that's a very good point. It's a good point by Tim and it's a good point by you. The bottom line though, uh, is that people don't understand the economic effect of migration. Um, there's a certain racist element to opposing migration. Right. Um, and um, at the end of the day, it, it, migration is a political weapon to be used by people who seek political power. Uh, and there's nothing different between that and old fashioned demagoguery. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Tim. It's been a very interesting discussion. Aloha. <laughs>